Well, good morning. As, been men- as has been mentioned already, we're privileged this morning to hear from Ben Little, who's with us here from South Africa. Not for long, he's flying back over the Atlantic tomorrow to his home, and so please remember him and his journey in your prayers. But for those that don't know Ben, you're in for a treat. He is a servant of God, uh, not only in South Africa, but throughout the continent, from the preaching that he does at the Benoni Church of Christ to the teaching at the Southern Africa Bible College to his work with World Bible School. He has ambitious uh, growth plans to accompany a work that's already borne such great fruit across across that country. And so we're privileged to have him this morning. I know he's got um, a lot to lay out for us here that's going to encourage us all. So Ben, come preach the word. Good morning, everybody. It truly is an absolute privilege to be here this morning. I bring you greetings from so many different congregations in South Africa that I'm privileged to work with, and also from the Southern Africa Bible College, where I'm currently working full-time as a um, a lecturer, uh, as a recruiter, development manager, uh, gardener, amongst other things. (laughs) But it truly is a joy to be here, and uh, I'd like to take the time to thank the elders and the deacons and the leadership of uh, this great congregation that supports our work, and not just our work, but so many other works, uh, including the Bible College as well. So it truly is a privilege to be here, and there are so, so many wonderful folks that I love dearly uh, at this congregation. Uh, And uh, I was saying uh, this morning that there's an African saying that when uh, brothers and sisters travel from other parts of Africa, Uh, to to visit visit, uh, another country uh, where there are brothers and sisters as well, they would say, I am home from home. And that's what I want to say this morning to you here at Cal. I am home from home. This morning's uh, lesson, I I didn't know that this would have uh, some significance for what's currently happening, especially down in the southeast uh, of the USA, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the states that have been affected by Hurricane Helene uh, and also uh, Hurricane Milton. Uh, I was uh, very privileged uh, to escape that because I was down south two weeks ago. And um, the Friday that I left, uh, Friday night I left South Africa, landed Saturday morning, not knowing that just the previous day, 2,500 flights were canceled. Uh, were prevented from landing at the airport in Atlanta. So uh, uh, I was uh, very privileged and blessed because I was thinking, you know, if we couldn't land in Atlanta and I had to go somewhere else, where would I have stayed? I would probably have just uh, looked up on Google uh, to find the nearest church of Christ because uh, I know I would have been uh, welcomed by the brethren there as well. So this morning's lesson, there is pain in the pathway, and I think I'm just going to focus, uh, 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 switch my eye, because I normally preach from an iPad, I'll just switch those off and and talk about uh, what's on our slides this morning. Uh, Admiral James Stockdale, I'm sure he's no stranger uh, to, uh, especially to military folks, but uh, he was, uh, he, he was imprisoned and tortured for over seven years. Uh, in Hanoi during the Vietnam War. And uh, he was tortured mercilessly for about four years in solitary confinement, two of which were spent wearing leg irons. Uh, and there were many things that this man uh, would, uh, would, would teach uh, folks from that, uh, that, that imprisonment and that torturing in, in Vietnam. But after 15 successive torture sessions, uh, to try and extricate some information uh, from him, uh, so that uh, you know they could, uh, you know, that they could uh, use in, in terms of their warfare. Uh, but uh, they tried to extricate this information. But he preferred he would rather commit suicide than pass on this valuable information. And what they did uh, actually was uh, his captors were so impressed with his indomitable spirit. Uh, that they, uh, you know, that they stopped torturing him. He was he stubbornly refused uh, to uh, to pass on very valuable military secret, uh, secrets that they could use against him. Uh, he was released in 1973, and when he came back to the U.S., he received the Congressional Medal of Honor and went on to serve uh, the American government. 
And so life as a Christian, as we get into our lesson this morning, life as a Christian very often is not an easy or a comfortable journey. As some people assume, uh, sometimes when, uh, when, when we convert people to Christ, especially folks that are going through difficult times, like economic hardship, or they're going through some kind of loss, and they think that if they obey the gospel, that their problems will come to an end. Well, very often that doesn't happen. And people sometimes become disillusioned because they thought that uh, if I obey the gospel, God is going to bless me and all my troubles will go away. But often we are not exempt from life struggles as believers. But as we study the scriptures, we, re we realize that the path of a Christian is not free from pain. In fact, there is often pain in the pathway which uh, calls us to endure suffering uh, and, of course, very often heartache and trials. Uh, uh, my, uh, I, I'm very privileged because my host family, uh, I've known for many, many years, I think since 2008, Nanny Jean and Phil Hayes, and they are my American parents because I don't have parents back home. And so, again, to uh, drive on my point of being home from home, and so uh, I just love being with them. I'm like a son in their house, and uh, I'm really, really privileged uh, uh, to, to stay with them every single time. So uh, Daddy Phil, as I call him, uh, read for us this morning, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of various kinds, uh, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And I know this is difficult for us to, to think about that uh, God wants, we know God wants us to be, uh, to be uh, perfect and mature and complete, but Lord, do you have to use trials to get me there? Amen. <laughs> right? And yet that is God's way of producing this beautiful fruit within us and growing our uh, perseverance. By the way, uh, it would be remiss of me not to say this, but uh, I thoroughly enjoyed Brother Myron's Bible study this morning, uh, and I, I learned something. I learned so much from that study this morning from uh, Genesis chapter 24, beautiful account of uh, Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, going to get a wife for the son of promise for Isaac. Wonderful. I love the, uh, the songs this morning, and also Brother Steve, the, uh, the thoughts at the Lord's table. I really, really appreciated uh, all of that uh, this morning. So I've got two questions for us this morning. May I ask you, what are you going through right now? And secondly, how can you and I profit from the pain? Um, I have a hobby that um, I like to listen to uh, or watch podcasts on YouTube on Stoicism. And there are several parallels that Stoicism has to, uh, to Christianity. And, and one of the parallels that I like is, and something I had to learn, is not to expect life to be as I want it to be, but to accept it as it is. And it truly is a liberating uh, thing. But what can we learn from, uh, from, from pain, the pain in the park? And number one, pain shapes our character. As we said earlier, that uh, God wants to perfect us and uh, make us complete. So the trials we face are not arbitrary. They are not without reason. And God often allows these trials to shape us. Uh, our brother James reminds us that, um, that we, we should consider it a joy whenever we face trials of various kinds. It might not, and it generally is not a joy when we go through these trials, right? It's not a joy, it's not great. But James says, consider it a joy whenever you face trials of various kinds. And he says, knowing that the perseverance, the testing of your faith produces this uh, perseverance. And of course, perseverance has to finish uh, its work. Sometimes, especially when I do counseling, folks would say, why is God punishing me like this? And it's not God punishing us. We live in a fallen world, right? It's a fallen world that we live in. And uh, sometimes bad things will happen to good people. I recently had, um, I acquired, and I've got to watch the time, I don't want to be, I don't want to go over time, uh, but I had a, a good deed gone wrong just a few months ago. Have you ever experienced that? Uh, you did a good deed and it backfired, right? Good deed gone wrong. 
And it was about uh, one of our students, our third year students at the Bible College said that her mother uh, was a widow. Uh, she had a little cat and the cat had gotten old and it got to a point where they had to put the cat down. I don't know if that makes sense. They had to uh, euthanize the cat. And uh, she said a mother, she felt that a mother was pining over this cat. So she said, do you know of someone that has a little kitten that uh, I could give to my mom? And I said, sure, I'll look around. I, well, I sent some messages. We use WhatsApp uh, almost exclusively in South Africa as a means of communication because it's cheap uh, and it's free uh, most of the time. And so I sent out a WhatsApp message to my contacts. And sure enough, someone said, I know of someone who has a little cat. It's not a kitten, but it's a young cat. Well, I, I made all the arrangements. The next day I got the cat, put it in a box, took it over to uh, what I thought would be a happy, smiling lady. And then she said, but I told my daughter I didn't want another cat. <laughs> and I stood there, box in hand, and I just, in my mind, I just said, mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. And I said, well, you keep the cat, so we, you know, we can sort this out. You speak to your daughter. Uh, and I thought that she would relent and say, oh, I'll take the little kitty cat. It's so cute. Uh, but I got a message later on to say, my mom is furious about the cat. She doesn't want the cat. Can you find someone else who would like a cat? And that's how I ended up with a cat. <laughs> and she's really cute. Her name is Zara. I don't have a picture of her. But yes, sometimes, you know, like the saying goes, life will hand you a bag of lemons. And what have we been trained and taught to do? Make lemonade, right? And very often, someone will say to me, um, how are you doing, Brother Ben? And I'd say, I'm making lemonade. So, faith is formed in the crucible of adversity. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, after Paul talks so wonderfully about uh, this grace in which we stand, this access that we have to God through Christ. He goes on to say, he segues into a different part in Romans 5, 3 and 4, where he says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. So I see some kind of agreement with James here, where Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings. And I think it's a mindset, right? It's a changing of the narrative, where I don't look at sufferings and trials as problems and as God punishing me, but I look at it with the idea that, that says, what can I learn from this trial? What is this trial trying to teach me? You know, very often when we hit a series of setbacks and trials, we go with each passing trial and challenge and problem, we go, oh no, here we go again. But someone has said, maybe I should change the narrative and say, here we grow again. Because each trial is an opportunity for me to learn and to grow. And so as Paul continues, he says that we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. In fact, that word is an interesting word for character there. The Greek says uh, dokimos, which means proven character. It, it is used of the testing of metals, especially gold. And it says that this has been tested, this coin, this gold coin has been tested and found to be proven. It is found to be dokimos. It is a proven coin. And that's what God wants to, be, to have, this tested character. And also, uh, uh, it pr also pr produces hope. And we rejoice in this fact that we have this hope. In fact, to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul wrote, uh, Philippians 4 verse 4, he writes, Rejoice in the Lord, how often? Always. And he repeats it for emphasis. He says, again, I will say rejoice. And that he writes to us from uh, prison. Now this, oh, there we go. So when we are walking through seasons of pain, whether it be personal loss, financial struggles, and by the way, we deal with that quite a lot in South Africa. And I know you do uh, too here in the U.S. When we look at the bulletin, we look at the prayer list, we see all of uh, the, the, the pain and the loss and the suffering and the illnesses and the diseases that people are going through. And, and this is a part of life. But when we go through these 
struggles of life, whether it be personal loss or struggle or financial loss, emotional health, uh, health issues or emotional wounds, we know that God is at work in your and my life. So here are four quick things I want to hold before us. Uh, and these four things are uh, what the trials are bringing about or providing for us in our lives. Firstly, there, there are opportunities for growth. As we said earlier, here we grow again. Number two, God is shaping your character. Someone said that uh, I am not where I need to be, but I thank God I am not where I used to be. And of course, God is helping me to shape my character, to refine my character so that I can be where I need to be. And that is in accordance with Romans 8.29, to be conformed to the image of God's beloved Son. Number three, this is what we need. We need to build our endurance. Like an athlete, uh, an Olympic athlete, one of the things that they would uh, seriously work on and build from, uh, from morning to, to, to night uh, to the night is this idea of endurance. And of course, fourthly, it deepens our faith. Faith is produced in the crucible of adversity. Think about, we spoke about the testing of metals earlier, and as Job would speak about uh, the fact that when God has completed this testing process, he says, I'm going to come forth as gold. After he has refined me, Job, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, he says in Job 23 verse 10, I will come forth as gold. Number two, pain deepens our dependence on God. We are living in a world that is self-reliant and self-dependent. And uh, we're living in a world where, you know, we want to decide for ourselves. I want to decide uh, the road that I want to take and how I want to walk that road. But as Christians, oftentimes pain will help to deepen our dependence of God. In times of ease, we often rely on our own strength. It's when we hit the, the wall of difficulty uh, and the wall of pain that we recognize our desperate need for God. Uh, David viewed uh, this as a pit of despair in Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, where David pictures himself having been lifted up out of the deep, miry clay. He says, I, I, I cried out to the Lord. Have you ever been there where you maybe uh, uh, laying in your bed at night, the early hours of the morning when you cannot sleep, and all you can do is to cry out to the Lord? One of the things I've learned uh, in my time of, 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 uh, of trial, of course, they would come up periodically, uh, and that is when I cannot sleep at night, I would quietly quote Psalm 23 to myself. I'd quietly just lie there and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my foes. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And David knew that whatever he was going through, whether he was fleeing, from Saul or from Absalom, or whatever persecution David was facing, David knew one thing, and that was that the Lord was his shepherd, and therefore he did not lack. And very often I would fall asleep in the midst of praying that psalm, as the Holy Spirit would comfort me and strengthen me during that particular time. And I'm using that in the sense of the comfort from the Word and uh, God comforting his child. Paul experienced this first hand when he faced his thorn in the flesh. You remember that? And we think of here's this great apostle Paul, a man that could heal the sick, a man that could drive out demons, raise the dead, and yet Paul had this painful thorn in the flesh. And I often say, tongue in cheek, that the thorn had a point. And the point was that God's grace was sufficient for him. But at least Paul got an answer. Remember Jesus, when Jesus is on his face in the garden of Gethsemane and he's praying, Father, if it be your will, please let this cup pass from me. Three times Jesus prayed, but there was no answer from heaven for Jesus. At least Paul got an answer. And God encouraged Paul by saying, my grace 
is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in your weakness. And again, sometimes I wish that wasn't the case. One guy was talking about uh, the fact that, you know, very often God will use our weakness uh, uh, to perfect uh, his strength through us. And he also said something that uh, God will never give you a burden that is too heavy for you to carry. But he continued and said, I just wish God wouldn't trust me so much. <laughs> and I feel like that sometimes when you're faced with a seemingly insurmountable burden. Lord, how am I going to get through this? And sometimes it appears as if there's no answer uh, from heaven. By the way, I had to share this with you that... Um, Yesterday, I, I got a message just after the, uh, uh, the, the conference in Dallas, uh, and it was of a baptism. It was a picture of a baptism. One of my World Bible School students, that uh, the lady, a widow called Seipati, I wish I had time to tell her about Seipati, that came to the college after losing her husband in a car wreck and her eldest son. And uh, she came to the college and went through the college, and now she is working with me doing the World Bible School online program. And Sister Say Party facilitated this in my absence. I was so thrilled about that because that's where we headed with this, equipping the next generation to be able to take the gospel uh, forward into the next uh, period. Then. So we have, uh, we have voices and choices. Um, when you're in pain, don't shy away from God. Run to him. Uh, instead of asking why me, rather say, Father, what are you uh, teaching me through this? So uh, pain can be a tool that drives us to rely more on his sufficiency rather than our own uh, capabilities. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. This is a well-worn passage of Scripture where the proverb writer uh, here, Solomon, is telling his son not to lean on his own understanding, but to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Another version says, will make level paths uh, for your feet. So, what are you going through? Or what you, going, what you are going through, rather, will either make you bitter, or it will make you better. And we have the power over that choice to either become better rather than bitter. Again, Admiral James Stockdale said, the worst thing that can happen is death. But he also adds and says, and yet that's not the worst thing that can happen either. Third, and I have to go quickly now, pain connects us to the sufferings of Christ. We know that as Christians we are called to follow Christ. And part of this uh, is sharing in his sufferings. I love how the Apostle Paul puts this because we know that the Apostle Paul had his share of sufferings as we mentioned earlier. But he says to the Philippians in uh, chapter 3 and from verse 10 through 14, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, becoming like him in his death and also somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. He goes on to say, not that I have already obtained all this or already been made perfect. He says, but one thing I do, I, I, press, uh, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And then he says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. And so, even the Apostle Peter writes, dear friends, do not be surprised. But isn't that what always happens? Trials catch us off guard. Trials catch us uh, sometimes off our game, right? I always say to folks that, and I had to learn this lesson as well, that uh, very often when life is good, I'm lying in my bed and praying before I go to bed or when I wake up in the morning. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I used to do that as well. But I find that when the trials are knocking at my door, I'm on my knees praying. And so what I'm learning to do is to hit the floor first thing when I wake up in the morning because I don't know what the day will bring forth. And so uh, Peter writes, do not be surprised at the fiery trials. Uh, he, he says, as if, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot read that very well from here. 
Uh, I made this font too small. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is uh, revealed. Lastly, pain is temporal, but glory is eternal. Now here's another little paradox that I find where Paul says in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 17, he, he, he speaks about our light and momentary troubles. And sometimes they don't feel as if they are light or feel as if they are momentary. And so no matter what pain you're walking through today, it has an expiration date. We have to realize that this too shall pass. It will come to an end. And I think that's what I need to remind myself. It will end. Your current suffering, no matter how intense, cannot compare to the eternal joy that awaits you. And the Bible reminds us again and again that the trials of this life are nothing compared to the glory that is coming. I just love Hebrews 12 too because it's in the context of the crucifixion. It's in the context of the, the brutal pain that was inflicted on our Savior, the cross. Uh, I don't think we can truly adequately understand what Jesus went through on the cross. And we've heard several explanations, even medical explanations from medical doctors as to the medical condition of Christ on the cross. And it brings us to tears sometimes. But it's in the midst of this that the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 12 verse 2 that we need to fix our eyes. Not on our pain, not on our problems, not on our trials, not on our tribulations, but on our Savior. Because when I do that, my pain fades into insignificance. When I try to comprehend what Jesus went through for us, not for his own sins or shortcomings. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, sworn in shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this brings perspective, and I think this is for us uh, the key here, that the pain of Christ brings perspective to the problems that I'm going through. So whenever you think of your pain, don't get fixated and focused on that. Rather, fix your eyes and fix your mind on Jesus it helps to balance our pain. Knowing that he suffered and died for us helps to ease the pain. First Peter 2.25, where Peter also said that Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. I want to tell you a story, a true story, and then I'm going to quit. And the story is about a lady whose name is Zibi Mtetwa. And Zibi Mtetwa had two daughters. The uh, oldest one was Owami, and the younger one was Mbali. Uh, they were visited during our winter campaign uh, during this year when the school was on break, July, the July winter break. And Owami, the older daughter, had been brutally raped and murdered by a close family member, a cousin. And as if to add insult to injury, Mbali, the younger girl, had also been raped by the same man, fortunately uh, not murdered. And she was eight and a half months pregnant by the time that our group of second and third year Bible college students happened to walk in the village of Rifilwe. And uh, when they came to, uh, they came to, to her house, uh, Zibi was sitting outside with her head in her hands. And she was wondering what she was going to do next because she did not even have food in her house. And she had a daughter who was pregnant uh, by a cousin of hers who also had murdered and raped her older daughter, Owami. True story, this very heart-rending and very uh, touching story. And so our group sat down with her, they encouraged her, they taught Zibi and her daughter Mbali the gospel, and they were baptized that same day into Christ. And this single mom said these words after her baptism, I am so glad that you found me. And those words broke my heart when I heard them for the first time. Because here was a family, and in fact, they, uh, they, they, they still not out of the woods. The, uh, the good news, though, is that we are taking care of the, uh, the physical needs for food 
and, and things of that nature. We have promised to stay with this family and encourage them through this difficult time. Now, the baby has been born. Two weeks after the campaign, the baby was born. And the baby's name is Kanyezi, which in Zulu means light. And what this means for this family is that the light of Christ was brought to this family in a hopeless, seemingly hopeless situation, a seemingly dark and futureless situation. And I want to tell you, beloved, all of the preparation and the planning that went into that campaign, if it was just for Zibi and for Mbali, and to bring light to that family, then it was absolutely worth it. Absolutely worth it. And if you want to know what drives me to do what I do, it's things like this. It's situations like this, where people are sitting with their heads in their hands, burdened by life's challenges, by the problems and the pain of life. But along comes a group of young evangelists bringing the torch of hope and the torch of light through the gospel. And the mother becomes a Christian and a daughter becomes a Christian. And the baby is given a name that means light. That means so much to me. And again, I want to thank the wonderful, great church for being our partner in bringing light to hundreds and to thousands of people who otherwise would not have known about Jesus and his power to save. One of my favorite hymns, Brother David, is uh, Redeemed. I've been redeemed. And it's a reminder that I am privileged to not only have been redeemed, but to be able to tell others as well how they too can be redeemed. So in conclusion, yes, there is pain in the pathway of Christians, but that pain is not meaningless. It has a purpose. It shapes our character. It deepens our dependence on God. It connects us to the sufferings of Christ and reminds us of the eternal glory that awaits us. And so whatever pain that you are walking through today, remember that God is with you. He is refining you, He is shaping you and preparing you for something greater. Remind yourself that God is faithful. Don't you love this verse in Hebrews 13, 5? That He who promised is faithful and that He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And we need to trust in His promises and know that in the end, the pain that you endure will be transformed into joy. And so, thank you for this time. Thank you for affording me the opportunity to say a few words this morning. And I want to encourage you this morning that uh, if you are struggling with pain in your life, whatever it might be, uh, that if you need the prayers of the saints, please don't hesitate. Please make that need known. Remember that a problem shared, uh, a burden shared is a burden hard. Or if you're here this morning and you need to obey that gospel and have the light of Christ just envelop your life, uh, fill your heart with joy, and if you need to, 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 to obey the gospel and, and, and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of, of the Holy Spirit, won't you do it now as together we stand and as together we sing?